Good evening, Jerry Dunphy with tonight's big news in color. Thousands of anti-draft militants went on a hit-and-run rampage today in an all-out drive to shut down the military induction center in Oakland. Sections of downtown Oakland were paralyzed for three hours, and 1,000 police were needed to restore order. But in the end, the mass civil disobedience failed. The buses were delayed, but not turned away. And KNXT correspondent Rick Davis reports. One corner, the tension of the day reached a breaking point for demonstrators and law officers. A few picket signs and small rocks were thrown into the police ranks, and then came their retaliation. It was during this confusion and anger that this reporter was clubbed several times by two Oakland officers. Opposition to the war existed across all ages, all classes, and all races. But the protesters who actually took to the streets were mostly middle-class college kids, just as the policemen whose job it was to control the demonstrations were mostly from blue-collar backgrounds. So dramatic battles between police and anti-war activists came to symbolize a much deeper social conflict. To many policemen and their supporters, the anti-war protesters were un-American, spoiled, naive, intellectual, pot-smoking anarchists. On the other hand, many protesters and their supporters saw the police as beer-bellied stormtroopers, living symbols of how ignorant and authoritarian America had become. The police lived by simple ideas, us and them. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Whatever we do is okay. Uh, they take a very simplistic view of the world, very conservative. The myths are constantly being reinforced. So how do they feel about, uh, uh, about they felt uh, they, it's just they're assholes and we're the heroes. Until the 60s, few of these policemen had ever faced a political protest. Their training had taught them how to use force in crowd control, not how to avoid violence. Most policemen behave professionally in a difficult and highly visible job, but a significant few let their emotions get the better of them. I remember uh, marching in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and marching down Mass Ave right in front of Harvard, in fact, and uh, having the police on either end of us with tear gas and shooting tear gas at us and running, running like crazy against, you know, and running in the direction of the police in one direction taking a left down Brattle Street or one of the streets off of Mass Ave, away from these folks, and, had, and looking back at, at police catching people and uh, billy clubs being thrown around and hit and screams. Strange time to watch that. I mean, it's the first time you'd ever seen a policeman do something to uh, a white college kid. We shall end the war. We shall end the war someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I know that I Attempts to destroy the protests with force backfired. Time sets us in motion, can't you see? For every young demonstrator tear gassed or billy clubbed, a thousand more, shocked by how the riot squads were treating people just like themselves, took to the streets in radical defiance of the war. And sideways for a while. As they watched policemen struggle with a hippie counterculture, ghetto rebellions, and a growing anti-war movement, many Americans shared the cops' disgust with what looked like one frightening revolutionary mob. But the anti-war protesters were succeeding in one way. They were focusing the entire country's attention on what America was doing in Vietnam. This is going to be a methodical search, house by house, village by village, as we move north. As you can see, we're looking for tunnels, caves, anything where the 
Viet Cong may hide. We've been chasing these VC since 8 o'clock this morning. It's now about 25 minutes until 3 o'clock. These Viet Cong are elusive. You can't see them. All you can do is hear the, hear the bullets as they come at you. The Vietnam War itself was elusive for Americans, despite the fact that it was on the evening news almost every night. Part of the problem was that the film coming out of Vietnam conflicted with what the Johnson administration was saying about the war. LBJ and his people said America was winning. The TV reports were less convincing. The result came to be called the credibility gap. Very, very encouraged. I've never been more encouraged during my entire uh, almost four years in country. I think we're making real progress. Uh, everybody is very optimistic that I know of. The funny thing about Vietnam is that I, I was getting Time magazine every week. It came in the mail. I could read about my war even as I sat in the middle of it. And I would read about what Lyndon Johnson would say and what McNamara would say and what Rusk would say. And I could look around and see that, uh-uh, I don't know what war they're talking about, but that's not what's going on here. January 1968, North Vietnamese forces launch over a hundred simultaneous attacks on South Vietnam, catching U.S. forces by surprise. When these images started coming back to America, many began to wonder if victory in Vietnam was worth the price, the destruction of the country America was fighting to save. Of course, we weren't as knowledgeable as we are today about you know the business of war we thought wars were totally a moral thing at the time why didn't we end that war this little country can't beat us you know and and then the pictures on tv of our boys getting killed and the atrocities on, on both sides uh it was just nobody could understand why the government wouldn't finish this off it's so easy to do bring these boys home what are we doing over there french couldn't beat them we couldn't beat them. Yeah, that's well, a what, good what are we doing there? Yet we beat the whole world, World War II, supplied the whole world, boom, we went through like nothing. This little swamp we couldn't take. Then my nephew gets killed there. Oh, boy, I tell you, I, yeah. I get really riled up when I start talking about this, you know. We were brought up to never question authority. Isn't that true? People of our age group. And the government was right, and the policeman was right, and the priest was right, and mom and dad were right school board was right. Anybody that was in authority knew what was best and how we should think, and they told us how to think. But I never told my dad he was crazy. Shouldn't I let my government know that I think they're crazy? I think they are insane, really. This is an insane thing we're doing to my government. How we say it. Well, how should I say it? In a proper manner. I think an 18-year-old is oh something to deserve country. To serve. For what? For what? In backyards and bar rooms across the country, Americans debated the pros and cons of a distant war. I've listened. I have. I've waited and asked for good, good reasons as to why we should be there, and I haven't heard one. Well, I've heard one. That communism is a dynamic philosophy, and unless it's stopped, mm -hmm. it continues to grow. And I, for one, would rather send my son to fight if need be then have the country taken over by uh, an atheistic philosophy. Yeah, but Who? The Who in can't, particular? Can't go into Who? Do you really think that we're going to be invaded by right. the Vietnamese? Mm -hmm. the that Vietnamese. Vietnam is going to invade the Not United Vietnamese, States? Vietnamese, but Red China. Red China. We, have no we think that anybody who's committed to democracy in this country now is a radical, because democracy is a radical idea here. Uh, Certainly, was it was that. personal for me. These ideas uh, were not just speeches in the forum. The, uh, the pain of it all became most acute in terms of my relationship with my dad. He couldn't understand why I was so upset that with a wife and three kids and a pretty little house on Sunnyside Street, I would throw that all over, quit my good job, which to him was a great job. That was a step up. He had worked in a factory all his life, and here his son was a white collar with a college education. That to him was terrific. 
Why complain about that? Why throw that over to run off with these strange political gypsies who are into something they call the movement? It, it led to an enormous rupture in our relationship. for us for about 12 years, I think. And we had children that were growing up in, in the school system together. We had children that were friends with each other. They were almost the same ages. So it, it, it was sad for us when uh, the Vietnam War came along and we had such different views on what was patriotism and what was the right stand to take. I was working for a man that had a son that was a, one of the protesters. And I didn't feel right about taking money from somebody that weren't willing to support our country. And I was proud that our own boys were going, and it got to be the place where I resented the fact that I was helping him make a living, and my boys were going off to war. I think if our son <clears throat> hadn't been a conscience objector, you know, it might have been different too. But Bob was over there in the war, and our <clears> son <throat> was here, safe. And it, it just, uh, it really hurt. And then when Bob was killed in the war, it was very hard for all of us, I think. time is full of grief. The world stops about six months. You can't function, you don't think. Just live day by day. <clears throat> I know every night for, what, six weeks, I go in the bathroom. Sit down on the floor, cry my heart out. Knowing what I know now, and if I had another boy to go in a situation like Vietnam, I'd help him get away any way I could. As far as a situation like that, maybe the approach. No, you wouldn't have. No, I don't want to read. I don't want to read. I'm an educated American. I don't. I gotta find out what it's about. I was in World War II, fella, and I saved three years. I know what it's about. They got the nerve to walk around here with these flowers on them. At the end of this parade, they should gather them all together and put it on a grave of a of a soldier in Vietnam that got killed. Today. This is a disgrace. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's no white man sitting over there, too? Well, what the hell no, would he do? I asked you if he should defend himself at home here, too, with a gun. That's you what I asked. You bet your damn life if they keep on bucking him. If they keep on bucking him, <laughs> yes! Shoot the hell out of him! If you had fallen asleep in 1964 and awakened in 1968, you might have had trouble believing you were still living in the same country. Against you, that fuck up. There was many great arguments, but one of them was between the liberals and the radicals. The liberals wanted to work within the system and change it, and the radicals wanted to stand outside and hammer on the walls so they come down. And I thought, if it, I thought everybody on our side was nuts. What were these people doing arguing with each other? My way is right, my way is right. It was clear that nothing was going to budge unless she pushed from both sides, OK? Unless there were people in the streets yelling and people in the offices listening. Johnson's Democratic administration was increasingly under attack from all sides, from radicals, conservatives, even his former liberal allies. It's all very nice, but it's also very, a lot of liberal bullshit. The coalition that had given Lyndon Johnson his enormous victory four years earlier was rapidly disintegrating. It's very difficult for someone who didn't live through that period to understand that months, not simply years, but months make a difference. Uh, what it felt like in January of 68 on a college campus bears precious little relationship to what it felt like in December of 68. You've moved politically and culturally light years from those positions. There is simply that much groping for a new ground on which to build any kind of consensus politically or culturally. And frankly, it never comes. It just continues to, uh, to uh, spin out of control in that fashion. A nonviolent response has certain kinds of presumptions that I don't have to believe. It presumes, in effect, that we're dealing with moral men. We were debating uh, the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, I, uh, I was debating the uh, pro-United States position against a fellow who, in fact, later served on the city council in Madison in front of four or 500 people. I presented my case. He simply got up uh, and said that when the revolution came, people like me would be shot. <laughs> I felt that street fighting and, and, and disrupting life as normal and being on the evening news going, hey, your stinking war was good. I thought that, it, you know, it was, the, it was not going to go away and we were not going to go away and they were not going to get away with it. I mean, really, it was not going to be pretty. And all these damn liberals, I had grown up with liberals, uh, watching liberals say, well, we're opposed to the war. Well, put your money where your mouth, do something. And they, they wouldn't, they, so we had to. I remember back at the bar in our trucking depot talking to other drivers, and they just, we were just so angry. Uh, and it, not that we supported the war or any of this, but you know, we were sort of, this was all making trouble for a democratic administration that was delivering more progress, more work, unemployment was lower, growth was higher, and the kids didn't seem to get it. They seemed to think this could last forever. I shall not seek. And I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Lyndon Johnson knew that if he ran for the presidency again, he would destroy his party. Johnson wanted to pass on his power to his vice president, Hubert Humphrey. But Humphrey was also tainted by a war many Democrats were turning against. The world now demands the maturity of America we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our adventure in Vietnam, that we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people. I don't know about you. I ain't gonna study war no more.
Dr. Martin Luther King, who had won the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the nonviolent civil rights movement, was now using his persuasive moral influence against the war. Martin was becoming a nuisance. Martin wasn't this lovable, cuddly bear anymore that white America wanted to embrace. And you could sense that he was becoming another danger to himself. Uh, that enemy was out there. In one moment, just one moment, it all ended. That shot affected America. It affected black America in such a way, you know, I can't begin to express to people what happened. I know how I felt. I mean, the tears would not stop. And Martin was dead. They killed Martin. And first thing that jumped to my mind was clearly what was jumping at White America killed Martin. White America killed Martin. And God damn it, you're gonna pay. You're gonna pay for this. Martin Luther King's assassination in April was followed by riots in 126 cities. Forty-six died, hundreds were injured, 21,000 were arrested. In Washington, federal troops guarded the White House. A machine gun post protected the Capitol. They see us spend billions on armaments while poverty and ignorance continue at home. They see us willing to fight a war for freedom in Vietnam but unwilling to fight with one hundredth the money or force or effort to secure freedom in Mississippi or Alabama or the ghettos of the North. And they see, perhaps most disturbing of all, that they are remote from the decisions of policy. I want to introduce my wife to you, Mrs. Kennedy. Shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King, Senator Robert Kennedy, the younger brother of the assassinated president, stepped up his candidacy for the Democratic presidential nomination. He would oppose Hubert Humphrey as a Stop the War candidate. Kennedy was a strong voice for change within the Democratic Party and had won the hearts of old guard liberals, blacks and Hispanics, even some political radicals. By June 1968, Robert Kennedy was close to winning the nomination and possibly reuniting a divided America. Robert Kennedy, for me, was the last politician in America who could bring together rich and poor, who could talk to the whole nation, and had the moral outrage to challenge people in their complacency. And that excited me. In the California primary was in June, and I remember going to bed, and Robert Kennedy had won the primary, and it was clear he was going to win. All the projections said he was going to win. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot, and another man. I hope they can get the gun out of his hand. <laughs> Be very careful. Get the gun. Get the gun. Get the gun. His hand is frozen. Get his thumb. Get his thumb. Get his thumb! Get his thumb! Take a hold of his thumb and break it if you have to! Get his thumb! My mother woke me up the next morning and said Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. It all fell apart. Everything had fallen apart. Um, I really believed. I really thought he was going to be the next president of the United States. And I can't ever remember a time of feeling less hopeful about the country or feeling sadder. And I remember a 
day or two later, heading off to St. Patrick's Cathedral, where Robert Kennedy was lying in state. I waited five, six hours just to walk past his coffin and talk to people in the crowd and hearing the crowd, the level of sadness, the horror, the lack of belief that this could possibly be happening. the rebellions and the disillusionment that had been growing since the decade began exploded in a cataclysm, the effects of which still reverberate throughout American society. Something so valuable, you know, something of such immense spiritual value was taken out of the American people in 1968 with those two assassinations that I think we were unable to pass on anything of lasting a spiritual or moral value to the succeeding generation because we didn't have it anymore. 